All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Raw Dog and Chemistry. So the first thing I want to show you guys is I made a little separation flask or funnel, you know, really homemade thing here. Made out of a little cashew jar, and you know what? It'll do the job. So I go ahead and I pour this oil in here, and then I mix it with some water because what we do, if you remember from last episode, we added sodium hydroxide to this oil. So it's alkaline and it has sodium hydroxide in it. We want to remove that. So I add the water in there, add some more oil. I shake it up to mix it all nice and good. So hopefully the sodium hydroxide and the water can precipitate to the bottom and then we can get them out. So I basically want to fill this thing up as much as I can just to the top so we have the most efficient process because you will notice that a lot of this oil is water. You know, so, you know, we fill it up all the way, but we probably only have half a jar of oil left in the end. So, gotta let it set for a little bit, and after it sets, you can see the separation quite obviously. All those bubbles, I'm not really sure what those are, but the point is, the very top layer is the oil. And you saw how much of the oil we added and how much we really get out. Pretty much a quarter. So, now I'm separating it out, separating this water out, you know. And basically this thing is in the urinal, it looks like, and that's pretty much what it sounded like too. But at this moment, I'm sure you and I are both thinking the same thing. Like, yo, this separation funnel is designed really, really stupid because there will always be a large amount of water left over since it's on the side and not at the bottom like the actual real scientific non-homemade ones are. So I noticed this thing too, and this was a huge issue, so I, I decided to go ahead and make another one. And this one basically fixes that issue. Never be as good as the real ones. These will always be ghetto. But, you know, it works in the end. So I also noticed you have to take the lid off when you do this. Because otherwise it kind of like creates a vacuum. And then it, instead of the, the water coming out, it kind of like try to suck air in. It's, it's a weird situation. But anyways, I pour this water in. And I always wait for it to kind of go black or brown like that. Because then at that point I assume that's oil. And you know, inevitably some oil will always mix with the water. Can't really do much about that, but you see, this is about how much oil we have left. So I do this wash another time. I wash this about three times because we really want to get all the sodium hydroxide out because that's not really good for anything, especially engines. You know, it's just gonna react with everything in there and corrode stuff. So you gotta wash this stuff three times. That's at least how much as it buys, and that's how much I did it. So getting all this water out, same process. So at this point, I got all the water out, and I have these silica crystals. I have some silica gel and silica crystals in there, and a copper scrub to kind of stop them from coming through the hole there. And my idea is I'm going to basically use this strainer and these silica crystals, and I'm going to put this jar of silica crystals on top of this jar, which is on top of the strainer, and we're going to go ahead and put that in. So first, let's extract all this oil we got, right? So as you can see, after we remove the water, this is a really nice, consistent, um, just really cool oil. You see it has a little bit of red in it. I think it really looks beautiful, honestly. And I had to make sure I got all of it out, you know, so I, I poured the rest out of the jar that wouldn't come out through the valve. And, you know, before we get started, I got to ask you guys, I just have to, like, does anybody want a nice ice brew jar of oil? I do. If you don't, it's so too bad, mate. I take my sip. And you can take this L. So anyways, after that, we're going to go ahead and pour it in this silica. And, you know, I try not to spill it everywhere, but you know I do. Murphy's Law spilled quite a bit of it, which kind of sucked. But at the end of the day, I'm like, you know what? I'll just clean that up with some rags. And, you know, we should have enough nonetheless. You know, I probably spilled like a couple ounces. So this is the point where we wait. You know, this is really the point where we just have to play the waiting game, honestly. Because... I, you know, they use vacuum filters for this sometimes, but I don't have one, so this, you just gotta wait it out. It takes hours. I let this thing set overnight, but eventually, after waiting so long, I did notice two issues. The first issue I noticed is this stuff is still just as brown or just as dirty as it was at the top, at the very bottom of the silica, and the whole point of us putting it in silica is to decolor it. 
And the second thing I noticed is it was not coming through at some point. So, and I, I like I said, I set it overnight and it was still stuck. So I just decided, you know what? I got to get it out of there myself. So I moved it back to the separation funnel, tried to separate it, it got clogged, didn't work. So then I put it in the strainer, I stirred it around and I stirred it around in the hopes that, you know, we can get this oil out, get it to get to the bottom be just okay and you know what it did actually get through to the bottom with enough stirring you know like a couple minutes of stirring it did get through to the bottom but let me show you the issue it was just as brown and colored as it was beforehand so I poured it into this tin can because you know what I heard if we heat it up we can actually remove any excess water vapor, evaporate the water, and that will decolor it as well. You saw there was quite some clumps in there, so then I strained it to get any clumps out, and then poured it back into the tin can after I strained it. And after that, I basically have this pure pyrolysis gas coming out here. To heat this oil up, you know, we're trying to keep this a closed cycle, whatever. So, got this stuff going. And as soon as I put this can on there, it almost instantly combusted, you know. Like, it, it, it took no time. And I know that it's because there's volatile vapors that come off and evaporate. And then those vapors catch on fire. But it, it just happened so quick, it kind of caught me off guard, you know. And so, I, I thought, you know what, I have it too hot. So, I went ahead, I turned the temperature down a lot. And I put this cap over it. Uh, or just makeshift lid to just kind of keep some of that stuff in hopefully and uh, after about 20 minutes at a, a relatively low temperature this is how it looked it just looked like boiling oil boiling black oil so I went ahead poured it out into this jar and to my surprise or not really it was just as dark no difference and at this point, I knew that the heat probably definitely boiled up a lot of the volatile stuff in it. So I wanted to see if it was still the same or if we damaged it in, in any way. So I went ahead and I poured it onto this jar lid and tried to light it. And it would not light anymore for anything. And Despite it kind of, you know, looking like it would light being kind of lower viscosity. I poured it in another lid just to make sure, you know, maybe that, it, that lid was too exposed to air. But no. But I did want to see... What would happen if we do this test daily with diesel, which is where you kind of soak a, a paper towel in this in diesel and then you light it. So you see, I, I lit a normal paper towel on fire. I soaked this one in this oil and I lit this one. And as we can see, it, it burns a lot quicker, a lot more intense. So I would say this oil was really akin to diesel, you know, if you ask me. And it kind of got out of control really quickly. So I had to make sure I was safe, backed up all the other oils so I didn't have any type of explosions or anything. So I'd say this oil was pretty close to diesel at this point, you know. And I wish it could be decolored, but we couldn't get that decolored. So I was like, you know what, I'm not doing any of that stuff ever again. So I built a little makeshift chemistry distillation apparatus here. Uh, and it was really simple. As you see, just made it out of an old acetone paint thinner can. Uh, with a temperature gauge put in there as well as a lot of old plumbing pipe fitting stuff I had that I didn't use for my reactor I just put it all together really didn't even have a condenser in there because you know at the time I was like you know what I don't need a condenser very simple stuff all these different pipes and it's going to go down into a glass jar to collect any oils as you see here so simple like I said and I wanted to see how it works so So once again, I got the temperature gauge on there just to check the temperature. And I went ahead, I put a funnel and a strainer in here to pour this oil in. This was extra oil I had that I didn't pour in the silico gel because I just figured things would go wrong. So I had extra. You see there's quite a bit of water in there and all that. So this really, in theory, would save time separating the water and all that. Kind of do it for me. So you see we're running this thing off of pyrolysis gas as typical. Keep this system closed. And you know what? It actually, it, it definitely works, you know. So, the temperature gauge, I put it down way too low, so it was kind of hard to see at some point. But it was making all these vapors, so I knew the condensing wasn't really working. Because these vapors were coming off, and these vapors were volatile, so it was potential that we were losing things, or light fractions. So I went ahead and put this fire out with this, this tin can here, this pineapple tin can. 
Um, and, and seeing that, I really was like, okay, well, this system, it needs a better condenser, first of all. But after about 20 minutes of running, you did start to get some, some, uh, some oils forming or some type of liquids coming over. And that was quite exciting to see it. But you also can see tons of vapors, absolute tons of vapors forming and being lost. And I saw that too, and I just hated seeing that because I'm like, that's a whole bunch of energy that's just being lost, you know. So in the end, we did get this oil, this quite dirty looking oil. We can see there's a clear separation between the water and the oil layer. But despite that, the oil layer is quite dirty itself. I'm not really sure what all that dirt is. It could actually just be water forming zeotropes in there or other contaminants. I wanted to see if this was flammable though. So I went ahead, I poured it in this lid and lo and behold, this stuff was actually quite flammable. You know, a complete difference to the oil before that was kind of more similar to diesel, right? This lit right away to the flame and it burned for quite a bit of time. So I went ahead and put it, in, put it out. I was tired of all the black smoke. But at this point guys, honestly, I knew we needed an upgrade, okay? I knew it because this wasn't working. You know, it works, but it could be a lot better. So it was time to go back to my roots and go look for an upgrade. So I went on this long pilgrimage, searching high and low, and, and lo and behold, I remember something, a lost treasure, something completely forgotten about. Not this. Now that, that's Mark, that's Mark 1, the Mark 1 microwave pyrolysis reactor right there, actually. But it's not what I need. This is what I need right here. This right here. This beauty. Sleeping beauty right here. Look at this. This heavy, heavy gal. Oh, man. The days and the memories she has brought me. Guys, this is a very exciting moment. I'm sure it's just as exciting for you as it is for me. But what we have here is my very first microwave. No, not microwave. My very first pyrolysis reactor ever, guys. At least the only, the very first one that worked, okay? And this thing has been sitting in the back for years. I never thought I'd use it again. I was just keeping it as a souvenir. But now its destiny has approached and it will be used. So this thing right here is actually going to be an absolutely perfect distillation apparatus. And why is that? It's already airtight. It's already made of thick steel that can be welded. That can hold heat for a long time and don't won't get blown through easily. Uh, and on top of all that, it's heavy. So when I add all these plumbing columns and impacting and, and all this crap, it won't weigh this down and this thing won't fly over and flop over like this thing was doing. Man, only the OG fans will remember this. My very first live big distiller or condenser that I built literally like the first two episodes of YouTube ever. It, it doesn't really serve a use in the microwave pyrolysis because the microwaves don't get the stuff hot enough where it needs this much condensation. But that propane does, and I know it because, you know, look, look, let me show you guys something. This reactor has been running all night. Literally, like. Probably like 12 hours. Watch this. I can touch it. It's hot, it's warm, but it's not burning me, right? I touch those pipes. These pipes. From this. After like 20 minutes of running it, I almost damn burned myself. That's the difference. If you want to know the difference between microwaves and this, okay? That's the difference. You can't just set your hand on it like that. It's, it's a different process. What do we have here? What is this abomination? This right here, my friends. <laughs> this is what we call a closed cycle. This very reactor that I will be using to heat this oil was my very first ever pyrolysis reactor. You already know this. But we're also going to be heating it with pyrolysis gas. An absolute closed cycle, if you ask me. We're taking some tips from the moonshiners. We got a coil in here. It's going to have water. Maybe I might put some ice in there. Maybe not. Don't think it really matters. And it's going to go in here. This, is, <laughs> this was literally the old 
so-called reactor or distillation chamber but obviously I've changed it up I've added this valve at the top here and that's gonna be where the gas comes off I'll have a hose come off of that and then it's gonna run back down there if we have a lot of gas production after all this condensation perhaps we may perhaps we may not we'll see my old Liebig right here I'm not gonna have it plumbed together because there's no real points when we have this coil here and this is the packing this is the prime show right here this packing is made up of copper scrubbies stainless steel scrubbies and steel wool all put together and this is gonna act as almost like a barrier for things that try to boil over they're not supposed to they're gonna fall back down so this is gonna be a reflux packed fractional distillation machine here I also have a temperature a digital temperature gauge here beautiful stuff because we want to know the exact temperatures of the, the vapors and I also have this port here and this is where I'll feed the oil in this will allow me to make this at least semi-continuous so I, you know let's say I'm running this and I notice the oil production slowing down I just open up this valve here and I put some more oil into the top and what more is there to say we got it and uh, I, that's really all there is to it it's really cool looks really badass it, all, it looks like the younger brother of this guy right here doesn't it <laughs> which is really cool because like if you look at the the condenser especially on that one like compared to this one they're, they're pretty much it's the exact same principle really just a packed condenser um, this one has the copper and all that of course we don't need that for the microwaves they don't get the vapors that hot uh, but yeah, so here's what we have. Now let's run this thing enough talk. Mm -hmm.